Want caviar sound on a cat food budget? Creamy Radio Audio by the Freedom Fiends has great free tips so you can sound like a pro without spending like one. The most powerful form of human communication is one person speaking to another. But if people have to suffer through your sound, they'll change the channel and miss your message. Creamy Radio Audio will help you speak to the world with sound that will make people want to keep listening. Check out CreamyRadioAudio.com. That's CreamyRadioAudio.com. Are you tired of your taxes funding endless occupations around the world? Antiwar.com is run by people who understand that wars abroad become wars at home, wars on our freedoms. Antiwar.com is dedicated to bringing you the latest in news, views, interviews, and reviews from the top movers and shakers in the anti-occupation movement. Antiwar.com has it all, from thorough foreign policy analysis to interviews with whistleblowers who used to run the military-industrial complex. Antiwar, pro-free market. That's antiwar.com. It, it, there's a million ways to look at this once this technology, this this disrupting, decentralizing technology. And we, we tend to look at the world in this very American view, this bloated 300 million person view. We got to make a we got to make a fix for 300 million people. No, we got to make a fix for Birmingham, Alabama. We got to make a fix for New York City. We don't have to worry about uh, point, you know, point of order, st- point of order. As we discussed last week, there is no fix for New York City. That's just a that's that's a lost cause. <laughs> well, yeah, we sorry, can, we can go ahead. I, rec- and I recant. Sorry, I sorry, recant. Sorry, New continue. York City scorched earth. <laughs> We are just some modern day abolitionists looking to rid the world of the last vestige of slavery, statism. It's the Seeds of Liberty podcast with Andre, Dave, and Jeremy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 129th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more Especially information about you, this Estonia. at BIPCOT.org. Yeah, you got to keep up on that, Dave. I think you left one out last week. I, I listened back. I don't recall you uh, calling any uh, particular nation state out, so... Sure. Well, you know, you know, you know who gets it this week? Croatia as well. All right, a double dip. So, so Cro- Estonia and Croatia, both of them, solid. Screw yeah. you both. Screw them both. <laughs> <laughs> so we are back. Uh, <laughs> I am Jeremy, joined as always by Dave and Andre. What's up, gentlemen? Hey, what's going on, man? And this week we uh, have a special guest, one of uh, one of my co-hosts on the Freedom Fiends, Mr. Randy England. Hey, Randy, how you doing? Hey, hi, f- <laughs> hey guys, thanks for uh, having me on the Seeds of Liberty. Uh, it's pretty exciting. And uh, to Jeremy, have you on here. I know Jeremy, but but I, I've never got to be on uh, any show with Dave or Andre. This is pretty exciting. <laughs> And, uh, well, you know, we are very important individuals, and you know, imp- you know, either just, that or Randy has a very low bar, or Andre. Um, so. <laughs> I'm essentially no, really. unknown, so I'm not surprised you wouldn't have met me because I pretty much don't know anybody. I I I, I appreciate the flattery, though. Uh, you're yes. actually. All three of us are massive Randy England fans. I know that sounds crazy for yeah, I probably it, it does. Have fans it sounds out there, crazy to but me. But we're all <laughs> we're all Randy England fans here in this in this for this podcast. So it's it actually is huge for us to have you on. And, and wait, wait this wait for, for me to play time. this for my wife. That's what <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do. She she needs a good laugh. Well, we've all been listening to you on the fiends for years, man. Well, so, yeah, this yeah. is this is true. I mean, I, I introduced both of them to the fiends, and you know, I I I've, as I've said many times before. Before. I mean, I was a fan of the show long before I got asked to be a host, a co-host. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I think we would you would we would qualify as fans of yours, Randy. I think that's well. Thanks, guys. That's, well, I'll I'll take it then. <laughs> well, I I am I am of course fans too. Jeremy, of course, has the the voice that no one else can duplicate. Uh, Dave <laughs> has a beard that no one can duplicate. Well, and I Andre, I I find out that he's. Uh, he he's 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 just beginning a, a a law career, which is kind of exciting. I mean, you've got to, how many years ahead of you of sidestepping the state and trying to do that job 
uh, without <laughs> violating your principles. It's it's going to be it's going to be uh, fun. Oh yes, it's it's going to be a hell of a ride. I'm hoping to focus on uh, just sticking with business law, and I think I'll uh, have some luck helping uh, Dave out in his business with uh, with that <laughs> particular skill set, so I can hopefully stay uh, off to the periphery and kind of not have to deal with the state nearly as much as uh, you had to as a prosecutor and a defense lawyer in criminal law. Well, that's true. You will, because with, with a business law, most of the time, you know, you're working out those contracts and that until the other guy doesn't do, do something that he's supposed to do. And then it's your job to come in and go, you better do what I say. Or I'm going to get the state on you. And I've got to you. guns. <laughs> yes. And you do, well, you know, yeah, you do. You do because they have the monopoly right now, and most people well, don't you, realize. There's that. nothing else you you can't. Well, you can. There there is arbitration, and and if I was a business uh, attorney, uh, and I, I would probably uh, you know be more interested in going in that direction, and many many mm -hmm. attorneys are. It's there's there's lots Which of good I, reasons. I am. I am. I'm to go to honest. arbitration. Well, yeah, that's Andre's, Andre's and big thing. He's it all depends on the that. clientele, I, it, it, of course, but. Yeah, and you're being in law school. You've you've got you have an opportunity now to even sort of major in in the private court side of things if you if you want. Yes, yes, they actually uh, have uh, they offer a program at Faulkner University, which is where I'm going to school for law. Um, it's an LLM mm -hmm. specifically in arbitration and mediation. So if I can uh, manage to drum up enough funds to pay for that. I'm going to continue my education after I get my JD and go on to get that as well. Well, that would be a, that would be be uh, how should I put it? You know, more palatable way to do a career uh, because then if you have the dispute, you say, "Well, you do what I say, or I'm gonna I'm gonna drag you into arbitration." And then if we win in arbitration, I'm gonna get the government. <laughs> you know, <and> you, <laughs> we can't get away from them yet, but just you could start. Yeah, you're you're, put, you're putting one more layer between you and the whole government. One more thing, layer so. between you and the government. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Anything to avoid getting their 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 uh, inefficient hands into the thing, gumming up business. You know. It's well. It's, it, that's it, a good it point. It behooves private interests to go to to private arbitration and avoid the socialist courts because they're going to do a bad job at their job. And arbitration is a an economic want. It's a marketplace yeah, function. Of course it is. And I've always held right. that if you can if you can establish some sort of framework that people can see working for the standing in place of the court system that we have now, they're going to be much more amenable to the idea of private law and private law enforcement. Well, it's good. Right, right. The more so good let examples me paint a picture are, for course. five seconds, okay? Let me, let me so paint like a picture five minutes, for five right? seconds. No, it's not going to be five minutes. <laughs> so we have this blockchain technology now. We could just do a business blockchain where all business contracts that you know the two parties voluntarily wanted to do it on could be put on an open ledger and the businesses that go on this could, you know, probably mop up with clientele because they would have to be more trustworthy because all their books would essentially be open. So that's the world we're moving to. And the people that don't do it and try to hide their assets and stuff aren't going to get as much business as the people that are open. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of good to that. Now, obviously, there are reasons for secrecy, particularly if you're going to get the, get rid of uh, the government and you would not have copyrights and patent law um, many things that are produced the only way that you could keep a monopoly to yourself and everybody wants a monopoly for themselves the only way you keep a monopoly is to keep it secret you know the formula that's why wd-40 the hasn't filed their patent for, 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 exactly that's a, a perfect example uh yeah their their formula is secret and so is coca-cola's and Perhaps even Colonel Sanders, forty. How many herbs and spices? Spicy I don't chicken. Remember. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, I think it's thirteen. Something. Yeah, but I. I mean, I can. I can see why many, many contracts uh, would be private between the people that make the contracts. It, why not? I mean, yeah. maybe it's nobody else's business. And and as it is today, the normal thing is that your your private contracts only become public dirty laundry when you have a dispute and have to drag them to a public court. In fact, in a stateless society, you could drag them in front of an arbitrator who 
who would agree with you that these are not going to be put out in front of anybody. We're going to settle this dispute and not drag anything Privately. out in public. So there could be, th there could, there, you know, one thing about transparency is that people shouldn't, people in their relationships shouldn't be transparent. Government should be transparent as long as we have one. Yeah. You're, you're uh, absolutely anything, right. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. Go ahead. It should be 100% transparent. If, like, people have an des innate desire for government of certain things to, to for certain functions to be governed by a body that isn't involving the two parties okay that's what i'm saying here so with this desire there's going to have to be things that take over these inefficient socialist monopolized uh but they, market functions that are they, desires of people well, yeah, they've just been captured but they already are that's... the blockchain these the internet releases these things to us well, they take them back to a certain extent. Well, actually, I think. Sorry, go ahead, no. Jeremy. Oh, no, I, I was just go gonna. Ahead. I was just gonna say. I mean, to a certain extent, yes. I mean, I I tend to agree with Randy that while on some level, like that, the transparency that you were referring to, Dave, as far as building trust with a client base, uh, on one level makes sense. On so many other other levels, it just does not. You don't. You don't want to release a lot of this information to, um, you know, probably anybody. So, I mean, yeah, smart contracts to a certain extent could could probably you know, have some impact, but I, I think overall, a lot of people are still going to value their privacy, even without a, maybe even more so without a, without a, without a government, as Randy was pointing out with like, you know, getting rid of things that, you know, I think all of us agree are kind of silly in the first place, like copyright and IP and stuff like that. Um, but without that, mm -hmm. I think a lot more people are going to want to be more protective of their privacy. But in regards to, you know, needing these things to happen to kind of, you know, get, get get people away from the idea of government being the only one who can provide these services well this is already this this is already happening i mean there is private i mean private arbitration has always existed but it's actually from what i've understand it's actually been on the uptick recently a lot of the bigger corporations are turning to that uh more often um and trying to stay away from the court systems altogether so there already does seem to be a push i guess we just got to get it down to the little people you know, like us. <laughs> well, yeah, and talking about, you know, claims in between people instead of in between companies. Um, I did want to mention one thing, though, and uh, Randy, you were talking about, uh, you know, in a, in a stateless society, it would likely be more private. I, what I'm kind of curious about is whether that would have a positive effect on, like, say, discovery conferences and uh, the discovery process. Because, I mean, granted, I know usually if you have, you know, some sort of claim between two parties, Obviously, the parties are adversarial to each other, and they're trying to maneuver their way around each other. But I wonder if court records being public has a moderately chilling effect on discovery in general and the reluctance of parties to bring information out that's requested. It probably does, but there are I think there are many instances where uh, the court conceals documents. Um, mm -hmm. That w so that they would only be viewable by either the uh, the court or by the, by the parties, and depending on how sensitive information is, of course, the people that use that most is the government itself, because above <laughs> all, they they live in secret. We investigated They're, ourselves. Well, yeah, national in security, in the dark. Yes, yeah, yeah. The um, one thing I was thinking, you were talking about the blockchain, and and I don't know if how much if this is done at all anymore, but uh, I noticed I noticed that uh, who would it be? Left libertarians, I guess, or whatever they call themselves. I don't know anybody left libertarians here. The, the, the corporations are all, are considered <laughs> real villains, right? Oh yeah, uh, oh, and yeah. Uh, and corporations and. And I and whether they're villains or not, I don't know. I don't. I don't even care. But uh, I'm I'm thinking with the blockchain, you would be able to duplicate almost every function of a corporation, uh, along with the government. Right. You know, because the protections that that are now given by government could be given by the blockchain, because mm -hmm. people would could own shares in a corporate in a company don't I mean, right. don't call it a corporation Who cares? you can make a side you can make a side <laughs> coin or whatever or, or or anything as sellable shares 
It, it, there's a million ways to look at this once this technology, this this disrupting, decentralizing technology. And we, we tend to look at the world in this very American view, this bloated 300 million person view. We got to make a we got to make a fix for 300 million people. No, we got to make a fix for Birmingham, Alabama. We got to make a fix for New York City. We don't have to worry about uh, point, you know, point of point of order st- point of order as we discussed last week. There is no fix for New York City. That's just a that's that's a lost cause. <laughs> well, yeah, we sorry, can, we can go ahead. I, rec- I rec- can't. I sorry, can't. Sorry, New York continue. City scorched earth. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying there, Randy. We we have to we have to pull this down. If it can work for five people, it can work for a million. You know, if if it can't, then well, I I, I I'm not sure if you're saying that that. The, the solutions are going to be local because I'm sure that they are. Um, mm-hmm. They are, you know. I, I mean, but but the idea of uh, of having a a company that's owned by people that are whose owners are unknown to the public it can can be done with the blockchain right now. And so you would have the the biggest feature of a corporate. I mean, the idea of people coming together, pooling their money together to do some large project. Uh, you know, like a big mm-hmm. company or something. I mean, that is going to happen no matter whether you have a state or not. And so the the main the difference between a, a corp uh, having a state and not having a state, uh, you know, is the states make corporations and make them immune from make the owners immune from lawsuits, uh, so that you can't lose anything more than your investment. And if people think that it would go away in a stateless society, it won't. Not with the blockchain, because you'll never know who the owners are. Unless the company wants to expose that as a well, as an inducement getting, for people to do business with them, I I don't know how valid it is to say that people are going to be able to avoid surveillance in the future. Well, that's not with a, AI. They already have algorithms on diff- everyone. Yeah, but so those basically, are, you can't hold on. Those are two you different can't things. Own I, don't, I don't think in this world even. Yeah, but Dave, I don't. I don't think we're. I don't think we're talking about them. literal surveillance. I think we're talking about in terms of legal liability. If I'm understanding correctly, yeah, that's what I got out of what Randy well, said. Well, when everyone knows the truth, it doesn't matter what your legal liabilities are. The, it, no, if everybody knows the truth. the truth, then you will. Then they'll know if 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 they can break through and find out who owns the shares in the corporation. Then, then they it it would depend then on the community whether they would allow a person to sue not only a corporation that damaged them but to sue all of the individual owners of the corporation, even the old lady, you know, who's living on her, her shares or something like that. And it's not at all certain whether if the government got rid of the co- corporate protections, whether society in general would just step up and say, yeah, we're going to come in and we're going to, we're going to take everything now, you know, we're going to take everything that belongs to each, each of the owners in the corporation. I don't know that that would happen at all i mean this whole issue of property rights nobody really knows how that's going to shake out we i mentioned earlier ip and copyright that you wouldn't have those in a stateless society and honestly i hope that you wouldn't but you could have them oh you yeah you definitely could it boils down to whether you you don't need a state you you need a definition of property rights and if the community definition of property rights says that the guy who wrote this story is the only one that can publish it, um, then if the community is going to enforce that as a property right, I guess it's going to be one. Well, you have, all right, so this problem's already fixed. You have no, platforms like Steemit already out that put stuff out on the blockchain for first to market. So you could be the first to market with your idea, right? And right. have the first working model of something and have the standard but, and be the fridge, you know, that, the frigid air. Of, of the whole thing. And uh, how does that keep anybody else from stealing your idea? Yeah, I was going to say, for, doesn't first the market matter you even less in, a, in an IP less society? Matter. I'm the sorry, idea, what? The idea doesn't matter. The capital is what matters. Yeah, I, well, yeah, but I, that's what I was saying. Like, doesn't, in, in, if we're talking about a society that would, that would like, that, that we're not, that we're, you know, with no IP laws and stuff like that, doesn't well, that actually, that's, that's doesn't that actually make it like worse? Smart contracts. It, it, yeah, but it makes but it makes it makes uh, first uh, you know it makes first to market even more useless at that point because anybody because just because you're first to market so what somebody could steal it, somebody could take the design the next day and make it better than you and you're first to well, market this is could, useless because now you're out well, of the market already somebody blew you out of the water purposes, by the end of the week 
Well, someone yeah, could, but the, for all you, intents and purposes, could go make a, tw a, a tweeter.com right now, copy their entire source code, and hope for the best, right? Well, your I mean, first to market there would definitely uh, control, uh, unless somebody did did something better and took it away from tweet Twitter. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? So, like, like just because you can copy something doesn't mean, like, it, you have to be smart in this new world that we're going to be coming. You're not going to be able to use that state protection to, you know, monopolize your idea. No, I, and and I'm there's an underhanded that. secret behind IP laws, and that's how the state gobbles up uh, – uh, inventions and stuff that that uh, threaten their stranglehold on the economy and stuff. So they have hidden patents. They have secret patents. They make makes patents state secret all the time and make uh, regular citizens that just go in and think, "Ooh, I'm going to make a million dollars with this patent." They make them sign uh, NDAs and stuff with, you know, we'll come clack you if if you you say anything about it. So this is a reality that most people don't understand as well about the IP. So it's like, if you're going to have IP, you're also going to have this abuse at the top of well, it. No, no, so, I, I know, but I think we're talking about two different points again here, Dave. My, I was, I was, I was calling into question what you said, what you said about the first to market thing. And I was saying that, it, you know, without IP, that it matters even less. I agree with everything else you're saying. Of course. I mean, IP, I mean, copyright. I mean, I usually, every time, every time I think copyright, I think of Walt Disney and it just makes me mad. Um, and he just angers I, me. <laughs> the whole I think you have a you have a solid point about uh, being first to market. That advantage being lessened uh, without IP and copyright, uh, but it doesn't that that advantage doesn't really go away. Oh no, it doesn't go. I mean, oh no, of course not. It's it's still it's still it, regardless. It still matters what you regardless of whether you're first, second, or thirty fourth. It still matters what what what's the quality of the product that you put out there is and what you know. I don't. I, to me, like I guess I don't, are, I, I don't think first to market matters as much in the new world that we're talking about. That's just that was my point. But I don't think it'll go away. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. agree. Yeah, no, I, it, I, I, I don't think it, I don't think it'll matter. I don't think it'll matter as much. But it'll still be the central motivating force for bringing products to market. Oh, absolutely. Now, on the bright side, on the bright side, because there's going to be this ability to scramble to figure out, like if you if you bring out something in public and it's somebody's able to deconstruct it and make it better i mean the benefits of the consumer should be obvious right and you have a much better product on a much faster timeline than you would otherwise have had so instead of being stuck with the one thing that came out and it's been monopolized on the market for you know five years or however long the uh the patent or copyright lasts now suddenly you have you know anybody and everybody's like oh hey this is a pretty popular idea let me see if i can take this tinker with it and make it better so I mean, on well, the one hand, yes, it does put a downward pressure on on people to bring things to market, just because there's a, a, a less of a possibility. But the false of security of the state can't be the catalyst for this IP system. You know what I'm saying? It can't be the it can't be the reason for this false safety net or this false sense of monopoly. Well, but again, like, it, it, this is how I'm going to secure my idea. Well, no, you secure your idea by securing investors, well, planning it all out, and being first that's, to market. That's what, and then everyone else is going to have to ride in your novelty train. Well, yeah, no, yeah, nobody's, nobody's, nobody's disagreeing with that, Dave. Well, yeah, and, and we, that's that's the world I think we all agree. So we've got to squelch we, that like, fear then of anybody that's going to object. But 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 see again though, Dave. I, I think because I think Randy mentioned it before. You know, it's it's. I mean, these things could still exist in a free society. I mean, we they are the the ideas of IP and copyright are generally distaste, distasteful to us. But on the whole, most people like them. So it is quite possible that a community could, you know, a community, society, whatever, could decide that they still want these things and it still could exist absent a state you could have a. Oh, I agree. You could have a Jeremy. private organization like, uh, like Underwriters Laboratories or something that actually controls the 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 guidelines for that type of stuff. You know, I that could. I mean, again, I would like to not see it happen. But <laughs> Jeremy, did you just mention society? I think I did, Andre. I, oh my God, you're but, such a collector. No, no, hold, hold on, hold on. I got. I, 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 hold on. I'll be back. I got to go point. drop and do twenty. <laughs> bad host, bad host. My my uh my point was was skated over, but like we have already have systems like this, like Steam it, you know. Uh there's just one step away from us making a music music version of Steam it where everybody that puts that music out first is the first to market. There's it's undeniable. So you can well, copy know, it's, it. We're not like, talking dude, Dave, we're not talking about not being first to market. That's not the issue here. We understand. Yeah, I'm that, not that's, sure that's why that's important. Yeah. Um you well, know, it, for, what I'm saying you know, is, is it, it's a reinforcement that 
that IP could exist in a stateless society. Decentralized systems can provide IP backing quasi, you know, without any force. You know, oh, you're saying involved. that the you're saying that the blockchain could assist the Nazis that were going to enforce IP. I think that's what he's saying. Yes, <laughs> something like. Is that, that. good? Uh oh. Well, except they wouldn't be Nazis. I think it they removes like the Nazis. enforcement because people hate. When you steal novelty, well, right? Well, no, like there you can still tell has to be a, enforcement. A stolen idea. You, if there's no enforcement, then it doesn't matter. The market whether enforces it, right? To, yeah, to an extent, but, I, but without, but you say you say without enforcement, because if there's no enforcement, then it doesn't matter if there's an IP law, whether it's put down by the state or or a private organization. If there's no enforcement, then people go, okay, that's great. You have a nice little law there. I'm going to go make it anyway. Bye. I well, do, there's I, a I, there is ahead, an Randy. enforce there is an enforcement. If the, like you said, the public doesn't like the you know the fake uh, novelty person. If you're yeah, if exactly. somebody comes out with something, this was just like you know the thing when the Lord of the Rings came out and J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, they had a pirate copy of it was the biggest seller in the United States, and uh, Tolkien uh, because of the way the the I, the copyright laws interacted between UK and here and. Uh, he wrote wrote a letter uh, to to as many anyone he could find in the United States, asking them to please respect and buy only the copies of the Lord of the Rings that were from his publisher. And this other one was doing that uh, without his permission and provided no compensation to the author whatsoever. And the the pirate copy copy thing was was ruined and went out of business. Uh, because the fans wanted to support him, and uh, that's this would this would happen. It's a fear-based thing. Well, no, that, no, it wasn't fear. He was he had nothing to threaten. No, no, no. He was saying, no, if no, you no, no. What I'm saying me, is, is what I what I meant by that is what I meant by that fear comment right there was that the argument that uh, that we need all these IP laws and stuff is all fear-based. It's all fear-based. Oh yeah. well, they. I mean, they. I, they. They say that they're trying to encourage invention and creativity. Um, I. I. I don't believe it for a minute. I. I think that writers would still write. Inventors would still invent. Uh, the inventors would invent with the hopes that they would be, since they're first. They're obviously first if they're the inventor, that they'll be able to get it out there. But I also think that any discouragement of authors and inventors maybe there could be some would be five times offset by the advancement of the people that are going to be standing on their shoulders both creatively and inventively and so that whatever the technological advancement it is it'll go far faster or the pharmaceutical advancement or whatever the area is it'll go a lot faster if you've got a million people that are perfectly free to build on what you did. Yeah, I yeah, I hundred percent, I hundred percent agree. And and, know, and like I think that said, would people, that would be, make whole, a lot more prosperity than the mm -hmm. lame argument that well we're encouraging uh, creativity and invention uh, by creating all these monopolies. I think the monopolies are a breeds. far bigger drag. Oh yeah, you by know, far. Then the incentive to create competition breeds all of that excess, though. Well, yeah, That's, it breeds more. That 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 what that their their uh, 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 what you call it their claimed uh, object you know their claimed objective what, with these laws is actually like most things with government. It's just Orwellian newspeak because it does the exact opposite. It, it actually stifles. Well, innovation. we're here to help. We're we're Stagnates, here to help innovation. Yeah. You know, it it, it straight yeah, up stifles. You're telling me it. that if if. You're telling me that the health market wouldn't look different without all these patents on stuff. Like there, we would have like Wi-Fi connected hearts already. Well, again, that's like, but, I, but that goes back to something you were, you were saying earlier, Dave, about people not seeing certain things. Because again, the evidence of that is everywhere. All you have to do is look outside the United States and see where um, there's certain medical treatments, there's certain drugs, certain things that are able to be used freely in other countries, which on the whole, most people would assume are actually overall less free than we're supposed to be over here. But because... I Go ahead. Because they don't have these, uh, they don't have these regulations in their way, 
people can actually produce this stuff and get these things made cheaper and actually have them mass produced and, and have different um, options that we don't have here. You know, I mean, that goes for just about every market I can think of, actually. I, you've not even just talked about health. You know, I think we talked about this recently. You talk about the car market, the same thing. Things that aren't allowed yeah. here because of the regulations, but other people are using them around the world and doing quite well with them. You know, I want. I want to mention the vape industry because this actually speaks directly to what we're talking about. And since I, I work at a vape store, I've had to familiarize myself a little bit with it. Um, in China, they do have IP laws. I mean, they have IP and copyright laws. However, the courts are not good at enforcing them. So if you try and bring a claim nine times out of 10, you're not going to win or your claim is just going to be delayed, 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 delayed until the point where there's really not even a point in bringing one to the courts. So that being said, in China, which most of the companies that build uh, uh, vaporizer mods and devices are Chinese, um, in China, Shocker. if you differ, well, I know, right? If you differentiate the product by just a hair, and hell, you don't even have to differentiate it. You can package it to it sort of looks like whatever you know, say Kangertech is selling. You can sell something that has Kangertech on it, the Kangertech logo. It just looks a little bit different. The likelihood that you're going to get sued in court in China is minimal it's it's practically non-existent and as a result there is a huge diversity of devices and setups and tanks and all sorts of stuff and this has all happened within the last year and a half like a year and a half ago when i started working at my store there were like a dozen maybe mods on the market now there's yeah. hundreds of them from tons oh, yeah, of different manufacturers all sorts I of ways for three years as, so yeah i watched it. yeah, yeah no, it's, gonna, it's I, incredible i was gonna say i started vaping about two years ago so i've watched that whole trend change too it actually is yeah and and it's just it's it's because that there there is not this massive hand pushing down that all of this has happened i mean granted there are laws on the books for these things but since they're not enforced they're effectively void so it doesn't matter so, you know, having an environment where a competition like this happens, where people do, you know, for lack of a better term, get ripped off, not only does it provide a wider variety of products, but now the first person to market can be like, hey, look, it's authentic. You know, you're buying from us. And that adds a certain level of quality, a trade, like almost like a mm -hmm. trademark to the product that you're selling. So, it, you it, know, it's. I don't. I, don't think I mean, that's that. all totally, va totally valid. And and you know, the reason it doesn't cause a problem is because whenever you get into an argument about these, they look at uh, things that are covered by copyright or IP, such as books and records and and machines and things like that. But the thing that's so weird about it is that there are lots of different industries, even in the United States that are totally not covered by any kind of IP and they seem to get along just fine. I mean, why oh, do that's nonsense, Randy, why do the government, they're just going to fail. I, why, how do, why, why do magicians go to so much trouble to hide their tricks? Because they can't get them covered and, and, First and comedians line, with jokes license. So. And comedians with jokes is a great one because, uh, uh People, nothing, nothing gets you in more trouble than telling another comedian's jokes. Oh, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, yeah, oh, they, po yeah. they police oh, themselves yeah. pretty well in that regard. But, but that's that's policed oh, by yeah. though the by the society. If I can use that word exactly. And think, I think one of the uh, some other things that you can't uh, you can't uh, the, the design of a, of an automobile you can't in, in the restaurant business you can't copyright your recipe. I mean, you could copyright the words the way it was laid out, but you can't copyright or get a, oh, yeah. a patent on a recipe or the way that your There's dishes that, you know, are created. Yeah, yeah the, none of uh, uh, which is exactly why nobody knows what the kernel, which is exactly why nobody knows what those thirty. Those yeah, furniture design are. can't do that, and I think hey, you, I think you another guys thing have all that's had not Captain Crunch, right? <laughs> You've had Captain Crunch, right? Yeah. Yeah. You ever had Corporal? You know, crunchy or something? <laughs> oh, hell yes. Sir. That's what I do. I go to Walmart and I buy the cheap stuff. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Of the course. Knockoff. It, 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 it kind of tastes like it, but you know it isn't Captain Crunch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, uh, uh, the sm smell of perfume. Now that you can't copyright that. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things. How do these industries well, they just they, they survive they could, and thrive? I thought they could patent those, though. They can't, maybe not copyright, but I thought they could patent different scents. 
Well, maybe I guess well, I the trademark name. You could you could uh, patent a a compound or something, but but just the mixture of the chemicals that you use to get to that. You can um, okay. You know you can't you can't that to get that smell. Uh, you have to have you have to have components in there that actually belong to you. I guess would that be the way to then you could prove it. You know, perhaps something you created genetically. I'm not sure. Hmm. But there are lots of things that are that that get by without IP, and and I don't see the distinction between those things and things that are written in books and inve- other kinds so, of inventions. Well, no, that's I think that's Can, it's like who's got a good lobby, you know? Oh, well, the, these guys do, but <laughs> these guys don't. So screw the other guys. That's right. Yeah. Who can who can get daddy's attention to get the belt and beat the shit out of the other one, <laughs> basically? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I would like to pleasantly steer this conversation into a question I have for Randy. And that is, earlier in the show, you mentioned about principles and becoming a lawyer, just slightly. I, I kind of wanted to ask you, what, you know, if you're a, a libertarian, you believe in the non-aggression principle, property rights, et cetera, et cetera, what... What kind of principles are you going to have to be, I don't know, pragmatically ignoring to become a, a lawyer, take the bar and everything? Well, I had the luxury of not actually being a, a libertarian when I was a, a prosecutor. Uh, <laughs> so because you couldn't possibly well, just give people a background, because if they don't know who you are, this this will give them a firm basis. <laughs> Well, I, when I, it's kind of funny. I, I didn't figure out. I didn't figure out that I was a libertarian until about maybe 10, 10, 11 years ago, about the time I was leaving being a prosecutor. That was one of the things that kind of pushed me out is I finally figured out that I was doing things that I didn't, I did not no longer, no longer believed in. But, uh, you know, going back, shoot, back in the 60s, I mean, I was a, I was a paper boy during the Vietnam War, you know, just a kid. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was against the war from then. I, 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 up until I was about 12 years old, I was a giant statist. I thought everything they did was wonderful. <laughs> and there's something about that, that war. I think, I, I think I was so, I loved playing army with my friends and that. And I had in my mind this glorified image of war uh, you know, like the good guys fighting the Germans, you know. In, yeah, I was going to say France the World War II vision. So, yeah, of course. And, 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 and in a sense, that was a better vision than what I was seeing, you know, as I was growing up because the guerrilla warfare of Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq, those sorts of things, is very different from this idealized warfare where you have you're over here and there's these guys over there and they're trying to kill you so you're trying to kill them swords and, and axes you know, almost yeah yeah there's a certain you know uh justification of shooting at a guy who's already shooting at you and, but uh this thing over there in vietnam is very clear to everybody at the time that you know half the time you were probably shooting an innocent person and the rest of the time you know i mean you didn't know who you were shooting it was just a just a, a nightmarish situation that was worse than just being having your life at risk and uh, i very quickly you know just hated that and i never did find in my lifetime i never ever saw a war that i felt that we ought to be in so i was always at a war I always was i've been pretty much on the um I don't know the conservative. Um, I don't know right wing or something. I mean, I don't like socialism. I don't like government getting you know in anybody's business and that it's sort of thing. Greenies pause on anything. <laughs> yeah, and then about the last thing that the last domino to fall for me was the thing was the drug war. And the funny thing was, although now I realize that it's morally it's a problem. And it just should not be doing it. It wouldn't matter if the drug war worked or not. It would be wrong. But it was being a prosecutor that I and figured out that I realized that whether it was wrong or right or wrong, it wasn't working at all. And, of course, the fact that it doesn't work just makes it more wrong. Because <laughs> if you were actually doing some good by all of this oppression, you'd have some excuse to keep doing it. But you weren't doing any good. And, uh, you know, we'd take down all the drug dealers in town and they'd be, their little brothers would be back in business a week later. And, and I, I, that, that was the very last, last domino for me. And, and it was about the, that time that I just had to quit. And that was about, uh, 10, 11 years ago. 
And uh, I, that drug war a, has really sullied up their game. I, I, I well, honestly really, don't know why they haven't pulled back on it. I made a comment the other day that Nixon shattered this nation, and I truly, ha- I, I truly, I truly, duly believe that. So, well. yeah, but most of the public are are still with them, particularly on on uh, drugs other than marijuana. You can, you know, in a lot of places, you can get your fifty percent of people that don't think that should be illegal. But when you, you know, you go it's on, I mean, Randy, I see it all they, the time. Well, yeah, of course. Go ahead. They have a fundamental. They have a fundamental ignorance on who is profiting from these certain drugs being illegal who is bringing them in and what families are profiting off of it and who owns the prisons that are being filled up with drug offenders they have a fundamental well, that, ignorance and that those are just from those are all just that, those are those are just additional reasons why it's wrong I mean, honestly, though, it's just wrong. Just even if there was no, even if all of the motives of all the cops and all the people that run the prisons, if all of their motives were pure, it would still be wrong. And, you know, like, uh, you know, Henry David Thoreau said, if I heard there was a man coming out to see me who wanted to do me good, I would run for my life. And that's really how, how I feel about it. You, know, you got government is full of crooks, but it's also full of do-gooders. And busy I, like the, I like the crooks a lot better than the do-gooders, the busybodies. I hate them most of all. Well, they, who, they, who was it that said it? And I can't remember what it C. was. C.S. Lewis. Like a... C.S. Lewis. He said the problem with these well, do-gooders the... is, is that when they come after you, they do it with the blessing of their own conscience. Yeah, what, it was. Yeah, I think flowers. he said that like the capriciousness of the tyrant may eventually wane, and he might yes. get tired, and he might make mistakes. He might sleep. <laughs> yes, but the uh, the moral busybody will never, ever, ever take a break because, like you said, they are uh, they're they're um, God. What is it? They are they're cleansed of their of having to think about it by their own conscience. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right, and it's it's such a, a valid point. So, you know, you can. You can go at the, the you know, if, the, if you were just, if the government was just crooks, you know, they could each take their billion dollars and go home. And I, and I'd, I'd still save a couple trillion this year, but mm-hmm. it's worse than that. They're, they're out to, to, no, to it's, save it's me. the crabs. It's the crabs. It's, it's I know neighbors. there's plenty of crooks though. You're right. You're right. There's plenty of them. Oh, sure. Uh, well, anyway, most people don't understand your, that, that that top oh. of the pyramid can't stand up without the bottom. It doesn't work the the other way. It's the that's very true. bottom layer that that's keeps true. every layer above it up. It's not the other way around. The top cannot now, pers- support itself without the bottom. Now, Andre, what what sorts of compromises do you anticipate uh, becoming in becoming a member of the the bar? Uh, well, for one, having to having to uh, apply for and get a professional license as required by the state in order to practice law, that's the first compromise. Because well, that's as, kind of akin to uh, having to go in and, and pay gas taxes at the pump to drive on the road, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Which, I mean, I, again, like that's one that's of those things where I'll, moral, I'll kind of pass over yeah, that one. That's not a big compromise. No. Yeah. Um, as far as conducting business law, I don't know. I mean, I, I really, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with it as I should be, given that I want to get into that field of law. But uh, I don't know. Probably, probably my biggest one is going to be just having to deal with the IRS. I suspect. I suspect that's going to have to. That's going to be where I'm going to have to make my biggest moral compromises is just having to deal with the feds wanting to take money. Yeah, that's you what know, I like to do. When, when I left the prosecutor's office, of course, I left the worst possible place that you could be from a, a liberty standpoint. I mean, what more horrible job to be in than one where you persecute people for committing victimless crimes? I mean, Probably not everything. A police officer might be worse, I think. Well, no, you're, you're doing the same stuff. The yeah, but those are those are just schlumps that are, that are just it's, it's, carrying out the... the the will of the bad guy. Veiled violence. It's veiled violence versus you know. Well, that's well, that's what I'm saying. It's it's the difference between threatening somebody with violence and actually bashing their skull in. So I, I don't know. It, it's similar, but I think the actual physicality of of policing, I think, puts was a, policing was a stormtrooper worse than Hitler? You know, uh, no. 
Well, <laughs> you know, I, 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 we've had I, discussions I about this, both, but I think the moral culpability of the order follower. But I think, but I think they the culpability of the order follower is actually greater than the order giver. Well, I wouldn't. I I don't know if I could agree with that. Um, well, I, you know, I do. It, see, it's the other. other I, it's I don't the think other that's order followers yeah, that keep the other order followers on, I think in that's, line. Though I think that's two separate kind of uh, lines of thought, though, because it's not really the the Hitler and the stormtrooper doesn't really fit the you know fit the analogy for. Uh, which we'll go over well, right. you were talking about who does the harm directly, yeah, defends- and who and who who does it uh, standing back. Hitler the was the guy soldier, who beats so- you over the head, or the guy that stands back and says, "Hey, beat him over the head," you know. Well, yeah, I, but- I certainly think one is more evil than the other, but in terms of culpability, I think the guy that's actually beating you in the skull is probably a little bit farther on the spectrum of bad than the guy ordering it. Because at the end of the day, we're all responsible for oh, our actions, no, no, right? I, so uh, yeah, but you, this is this is hold on. This is what I this is what I was saying though. Because we originally started going. The comparison was between the you know we were trying to figure out which was worse, the prosecutor or the or the cop, and and now we've shifted it to the order giver. And the prosecutor isn't necessarily the order giver in that situation because you know yeah. that's what I, that's what I was trying to get at. He's that, just in the chain of that command. The, the, oh the, yeah, the, okay, the physical yeah, like saying. the physicality of the phys- you know aside from the physicality issue with the cops. Um, you know, because they can rough you up and do it with virtual impunity, um, and, you know, borderline kill you in almost every situation uh, or kill you and get away with it. Uh, but with the prosecutor, they're the ones who actually, you know, violate whatever principles they claim to have. And then will like, you know, like Randy was saying, you know, have to actually are the ones who commit to locking you up for a, for a victimless crime. Like that is their sole intent. You know, that is their Although, <laughs> the one point, one thing that probably when it comes to cops and prosecutors and judges are all the same in the sense that they are the order takers because the order givers are in the legislature. This is yeah, true. that's true. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, the ultimate order giver, they're the ones that said uh, possession of cocaine is a felony. And if you do it, you could go to prison for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, everybody else has taken their orders. You're getting mad well, at Well, yeah. <laughs> but if the hammer had a choice not to be hitting innocent people, he ought not be doing it. Yeah. Um, he you doesn't know, have one a thing choice. He's in the hand of the legislator. <laughs> you know yeah, saying? right. Well, he has a little more choice than that. That's why he quits. Well, I mean, maybe in America, <laughs> but uh, in North Korea, maybe not so much. Well, no, you always have you always have the right to you say no. You do have no. a choice, a pragmatic you may, choice. Yeah, I guess. you may you may suffer more in some places than another, but you can uh, always be drug around, back and gunned down. You're right. You know, you're, you're absolutely well, right. Andre, Andre, when you're talking about what you might be able to do, my my choice was was to be to do the one thing in law that I actually never had to wield the power of the state in. And that was to be a criminal defense attorney, because then I never took a case where I was not fighting the state directly, or I did some civil cases where I was suing the government directly. And so my my aggression that I was directing always was upon the government and no one else. And that I, I never felt any I never felt any qualms of conscience whatsoever. I felt like I, uh, I was doing doing heaven's work, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. Fair enough. Fair enough. As a uh, prosecutor, could you have not really just gummed the entire system up, or would uh, would have you have just been excised very quickly from the system? Well, I almost was excised on a number of times because I was always extremely insistent upon upon uh, having a good solid case. How and if I you, didn't sir. like it back, I just threw it back at the police and said, get me this and this and this, and I'll think about it. And uh, I had, I remember one time I had three highway patrolmen show up over, over at our office, and he went to the elected prosecutor, my boss, and they were going to go in there and get me fired because I told them I wouldn't file any of these cases because they weren't good. And uh, I, I, I got in trouble a number of times, but I never got fired. Well, you know. that's the advantage of being right. Is uh, you, there's really not a whole lot they can say about it. Are you in a state union when you're when you're a prosecutor? 
Oh no, no, no! You're you're you serve at the pleasure of the prosecutor. But if the pros if the if the elected prosecutor no 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 like are you in a union like a state union like a, no like, no absolutely is there like not. a, a attorney's a, union or not? no okay no no okay, you belong to the Missouri bar, but they can't do anything for you. They're only there okay. to uh, take your money and uh, and kick you out if you break their rules. <laughs> yep, that's a hundred percent true. Hmm. Well, or so whatever it state up you're from in. The inside <laughs> is kind of because a lot of anarchists are people that you know kind of swing anarchist or libertarian or whatever. They they sometimes they do have state jobs. They wake up and they're like, "Holy crap! I can really slow everything up and gum everything up." Like Ron Swanson, the whole scenario, and that's a reality. I, I know people f that that do that personally. So. Yeah, but there's certain it's it's a pragmatic thing. Yeah, but, but there's there, there's certain. I agree with Randy and getting out of the state job, like be about it. You know, well, I don't know. I don't know how long you could run that. Um, you know, I guess when I decided that that this was wrong and I didn't want to do it anymore, uh, I could have stayed. But I, I I can't imagine that I could have done much of anything. You know, it's kind of like the go guy that goes in, you know, uh, for jury duty and gets up and makes a speech about uh you know how he has the right to judge the law or something and the judge says get him out of here it's over and you know whatever in bring, bring had, in a backup juror yeah it's gone yeah and i i didn't see any opportunity for that as a matter of fact when i did when i finally left the prosecutor's office i was i was very seldom taking any cases that i had any any qualms about taking i wasn't taking victimless crimes much anymore at that point because i was handling i'd been a prosecutor for 14 years i was handling murders and assaults and robberies stuff like that so stuff crimes. that i have no problem with prosecuting you know oh yeah yeah those guys need to be prosecuted i there's people that are sitting in jail and not killing anybody today because i put them there and i have no qualms of conscience about that at all but uh, so in one sense, I might not have been able to even do much because I wasn't even doing that kind of work, you know, work uh, mm -hmm. anymore, like the drug cases and that that I had done earlier in my career. I don't know. I, 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 I needed to get out of it. I really did. And I was it was I, just a, I was just wondering, well, I, just in case there is, you know, perhaps I, a, an attorney that, that just happens to well, listen to this. I, I get I get what you're saying, Dave. I mean, that's that's along the lines of what uh, Ben Stone talks about in his wonderful you know work of <laughs> fiction. Perhaps, um, I was you know, hinting. Well, yeah, but but there, I, what I was going to say is I, I think. Like the idea, I understand the idea, but I think there's there's certain sectors of the of the government that you can do that in, that you can get away with that in. But uh, I don't even think uh, so much as a, even if it it was a problem with of conscience. I think in a in a higher profile position like that, I don't think you can get away with it as long uh, before they would just toss you out. Uh, you know, like I think you're. I think you're probably right. And there, there all always was a a lot of discretion between uh, what what you they brought in and asked you what the cops wanted you to file and what you did file. I filed. I uh, I only filed about oh four out of five cases that were sent to me, and uh, and the other fifth case got tossed all the time. And, um, you know, I was very picky. I mean, if a case was close and I wasn't sure that I could, I could make the case, I wasn't going to file it. I just wouldn't do it. I, you know, I mean, I always took that part of it real seriously in terms of this guy, this guy who I'm looking to file these charges on, he's a human being, he's got a family, you know, he's got a job, he's got a life. Am I going to just destroy all of that, take that away from him right now by the mere charge alone? And it, I know a lot of prosecutors don't think about that, but I, I think they say, should. You're, you're probably, yeah, very, I, probably no, a very rare individual. You. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just thinking about the prosecutors I'm dealing with. Up, I'm just thinking about the prosecutors I'm dealing with with here up here in New York, and you know, I've learned that they they they'll pretty much you know they'll they'll try to prosecute anything because they're really just trying to get. Uh, uh oh, they're they're really just trying My to get pre-show prediction. What's that, Dave? No, I'm not going. <laughs> Nothing. No, they're just no, because their their goal, their sole goal up here is to get as many people uh, 
uh, in the system as they can so they can get as many uh, plea deals going as they can so they can ge generate as much revenue as they possibly can. So I highly doubt there's any uh, Randys lurking around the DA's office here in uh, here in Nassau County, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> there, there, I'm sure that there are. There, you know, there's a lot of prosecutors that that play by the rules of the game that they're in. I mean, they're honest in the sense that they won't falsify evidence. They'll turn well, over so all evidence out there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, but they're go they're go but they, the you know you you say the Doug. I'd rather be in the hands of the Dudley Do Right because he'll play it mm -hmm. straight. Me too. He he won't yeah. hide evidence that could help you. I don't know. He won't man. manufacture it. No, that's not the Dudley Do Right. I'd that rather toss the criminal. cop a hundred dollars and walk away. <laughs> Well, yeah, but we're talking about uh, yeah. That's not going to work. That's not going to work much. Uh, no, I I don't know. There 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 are there are prosecutors that will hide evidence and and do crooked stuff like that. But I don't think the majority of them. You know, maybe half. Who knows? Um, I don't know. It's when you get into a mindset that the most important thing to do is to get in and get this guy and win this case. If uh, you, you almost you almost want the prosecutor to look at the job like any other job. I'm just going to go in there. It's, it's like, you know, when you're, you're frying fish or something, it's not like, well, I'm going to, this piece is broke, but I'm going to make it work and fit. You know, you, you go, I don't care. Just, just get rid of it. You know, let's go on to another case where I don't, where I don't have to have, you know, try to push the square peg in a round hole. And uh, there's well, a lot the of prosecutors uh, that work that way. Indictment record or whatever. It's like 99 or 98 percent. So, like, if they take you to court, they're winning. So, no, or, well, no, well, no, the, you're talking about indictment versus conviction rate. There's two different things. My bad. Convi it's conviction rate. My bad. Their conviction rate is insane. Once they got it, it's done. No, well, no, the actually, thing is, though, when you think about a prosecutor, he, if you had to play poker against a prosecutor, he, the prosecutor gets to, you get, you deal him a hand of cards, right? And he looks at it. Those are the reports that he gets. And when he looks at the hand, if it doesn't look good, he, he tosses it. He refuses to file it. So I told you already, I only file 80% of the cases that they gave me. So right now I've dumped all the turkeys. And if you do your work up front, okay, you don't, you don't get rid of cases except rarely. You don't you 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 see them through to the end because you knew they were good when you started. When I was a, a prosecutor, I very seldom uh, dismissed a case. Uh, no, I, I would I would if new facts came up. I mean, I deal with that and try to do the, a fair thing with it. But very seldom dismissed the case because I worked them on the front end. Now I knew guys that filed ninety percent of what came in and then dismissed another ten percent. On the way, you know, to the to the court, and then ended up, and then ended up with the same eight percent figure. Ended know. up with the same eight percent as I did, but I felt like, I, honestly, I felt like I was lazier because by doing the work up front, I didn't have all this fighting to do later on with these defense well, attorneys and everything. Well, there's working smarter, and then there's working harder, and I've always yeah, been told I, that working smarter is the better method. So, I well, I probably it was, ended up it, working smarter. It was my method, and uh, you know, it worked for me. And but but oh, the numbers that happen. Uh, in um, okay, if you filed eighty percent, I think the average is probably closer to like eighty-five percent. But if you filed eighty or eighty-five percent of the cases, um, at eighty-five percent, you're going to dismiss. You're going to end up losing or dismissing. You know, a, a whole lot more cases than if you're more selective about it, um, like I did. So I had a pretty good percentage out of the cases that I filed because I was pickier about what I filed. And uh, in my jury trials I, that I went to, I, I tried about 50 cases to a jury, and I think I ran in, came around 80%, lost about 20. And that would add up, wouldn't it? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure where, where you're supposed to be in that, what's the right thing. I mean, I've had people, you know, prosecutors tell me, well, I've won 95% of my jury trials. And I'm thinking, well... <laughs> You know, you've you probably dismissed or trade or plea bargained out. You know, almost everything you ever did because nobody can get a, a get a a number like that. You know, without uh, playing games with it. Uh, so oh, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. you end up you end up losing That's a certain percentage. About, you end up Maybe losing a certain else. percentage of cases, uh, even if you're you feel like your case is rock solid. You still end up losing cases for various reasons. 
I just wish everyone would take it to court. No plea deals ever. No, it, it'll never happen. Up. I, it'll I, never I, happen. Yeah, of course not. It's, because I, it costs. I, it, yeah. I mean, it, it costs money, time, resources. It does. Hey, eat up I wouldn't know anything about. Of, I wouldn't know about. Oh yeah, of course not. Yeah, so none of none of us have, here would know about that. Um, I do have one question for you, Randy, because we were talking yeah. about. Uh, you mentioned the drug war, and you mentioned uh, uh, doing thing. You know, having to prosecute cases or having to deal with cases where it's clear that this is wrong, that the law is wrong. Um, and I've been recently in one of my classes, my foundations class. Uh, we've been doing a very intense study about uh, the interplay between morality and the law and whether right comes before law or whether law establishes right or, you know, the interplay between those two. And I kind of wanted to get your take on that, what your personal philosophy is with regard well, my to my philosophy is that of St. Augustine, who, uh, you know what, 1,600 years ago said uh, an unjust law is no law. And uh, and so if a if a if a law is evil, it's not a law at all. It just it's as simple as that. And you may have to obey it because they're gonna, you know, they've got guns. But as far as your position on it, well, that's 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 the end of my analysis. Well, and and I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, if uh, well, when I was reading uh, Aquinas, he he did say he echoed that similar sentiment where uh, an unjust law is no law at all. But he also echoed the statement, the sentiment that uh, Socrates did in the Crito, where, yes, the law is not just, and I'm not bound to obey it. However, there is a social good to allowing punishment for violating that law because the law still belongs to society. So I was yeah, kind of I don't know about the social that. good. Uh, uh, the so well, the, well, like, the like good that point. I get from obeying the law is just is. Is yeah, I'll obey the I'll obey that law because you're gonna beat up on me if I don't. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm with you. It's uh, it, the well, reason I brought that, that up was respect because respect property are redundant in my opinion, but well, in a sense they are because you, you you when you were six years old, your mom had already taught you that you don't take other people's stuff or hit people. After that, it's all just kind of refining the rules, isn't it? Well, exactly. some malum prohibitive laws be. are basically all be. just "Daddy, don't hit me." Okay, leave me alone. Is basically all. Don't hit people. Don't 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 take their stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so, that's, so, uh, so easy a five year old can get it. But that's why we all we all obey most of the laws, at least the ones where if we disobey, we're probably going to we can get away with be hurt by it. Yeah. Oh. So if you can't, if you're not going to get away with it, I mean, you know, it's. Uh, you know, most laws. You know, it's it can be kind of scary if you're if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you can see five miles in each direction and there's no cars coming. Yeah, you might run that stop sign. Um, as a matter of fact, if they if you really knew they couldn't catch you, I'm thinking you might be mentally ill if you did stop. But that's another discussion, you know. <laughs> so I got one last question question for Randy. Okay, in your professional opinion. Do you think it's better for people to try to defend themselves in any way in court or take a state lawyer? Specifically a state lawyer. I know your answer what's a state, would probably what's be a, get what's you a, a good, state what's a, a state, public lawyer, defender. A state a state a, a public defender. A public oh, well, you can't that, afford that, it, a public defender. That would depend on which public defender you got appointed to you. Yeah, correct. I guess, but uh, if you got just, a, had just, a good one that had the time, it, you'd so, be it'd be you'd be better. But so th what, if you're defending yourself, that that usually goes badly. Not always, but mm -hmm. usually, it's it's yeah. playing the odds. Um, you know, I've seen I've seen some pro se cases that went well for the defendant, but usually it had a horse's ass for a prosecutor on one side. Who, who was so stupid that they didn't know when a case should have been dismissed long before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I know the, the probably the professional recommendation is go ahead and get you a good lawyer on retainer if you can. Well, so yes. if any time you have to deal with a law, you have someone that knows how to speak the language. If, if possible, you know, it's, it's a pretty dangerous place. Otherwise, it's a pretty dangerous place, even if they do know what they're doing. Yeah. Well, sometimes it doesn't even matter. The courts are de facto kangaroo. Well, so to an extent, I think so. Yeah, but well, I mean, again, I've I've watched from the inside for a little while now. It's 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 uh, not fun to watch, shall we say? But you know, I I don't know. I think uh, uh, I I know a couple of people who've who've uh, you know represented themselves pro se and won. 
Um, but again, like Randy was saying, I think of both, like as I was thinking back to those cases that I know of, as you were saying, you know, like either the either the prosecutor was pretty pretty much an idiot and didn't realize um, that they should have given up already, um, or I, you know, I one of those cases I, I thought of immediately was like, oh yeah, that was the case, and then another one I was thinking of like the the person like the uh, the plaintiff didn't actually have a very good case to begin with, um, so it was kind of easy as long as you know how to work the actual system because that's the one thing that I've the one thing I did learn because I looked into doing this myself, I looked into it in the past for doing it for other reasons too. But the one thing I learned is that for the most part, uh, if you're going to go that route, you re- you really have to at least have advice from somebody who knows how to like write motions and stuff like that, because that's usually oh, yeah. where, that's oh, yeah. usually where most people get tripped up is you don't use. Uh, you know, you don't use the correct terminology. You don't use, and they'll just, they'll pretty much just dismiss, you know, it, they'll throw your stuff out for any little thing if you're not following the the guidelines that you're supposed to. You know, if you just think you're, you know, I learned that on the opposite. I'm just trying to take care of a like traffic court. And I literally got a, a letter, a, a ruling from a judge that said my objection was basically being, uh, being, uh, what, dismissed? Is that, is that what happens when they say? Uh, whatever, whatever it is, um, they didn't care because he, what it pretty much said in his three-page decision, the it was when he boiled it down was, uh, Mr. Hengler did not use the proper proper uh, legal vernacular, therefore uh, his uh, the whole thing was invalid. Like that's literally what it came down to. So yeah, I, I know a lot of people seem to get tripped up on that. So that's not supposed to happen. Uh, a, a good court, a good court, the ones I've seen. Well, they'll they'll embarrass you and say, "Well, Mr. Hengler filed a motion to dismiss, and we'll chalk that up to him being ignorant." So we'll take that as a motion for something else, and uh, then and which would be the proper motion in this case, and it is overruled also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> that's what I figured would happen. Uh, we've yeah. we've read through some Normally cases would. In, uh, in civil procedure, particularly there. Uh, because we, you know, obviously we have to learn about pleadings and motions, and uh, you know, motion for summary judgment, directed verdict, and uh, motions to dismiss. And some of the cases we read, the <laughs> the judge, the way that he phrased it is uh, pretty fantastic. It's there's, I didn't realize judges are so colorful with their language, but man, are they ever. They really, well, they're they kind of really bottled up, and when they get the chance, they can cut loose. And you know, you were saying, I think Dave, you were saying, you know, courts being, you know, kangaroo courts. I mean, you know, if you say the kangaroo, it means yeah, they're going to follow what the what the law is. Uh, yeah, they are. But I think judges are just like, just like uh, you know, people in in the sense that well, like they are people, but they're in the sense that some of them do lean toward the state. And some of them don't. And some uh, of them you know, also belong to certain clubs that have certain agendas that ha- they have to push through their activism. Well, yeah, people so, have their biases and that. But like people will call me up that know I've been down here in Jefferson City, Missouri for quite a while, and they'll ask me about Judge So and So. I say, what kind of case you have? And I'll tell them, yeah, yeah, that 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 judge would probably be the most likely to give you a fair shake, as opposed to this one or that one. I mean, they're all different. I mean, they're supposed to be, you know, just like cogs in a machine, but they're not. And some of and so, you know, everybody leans one way or the other. I mean, they try to be fair, but you know, who, who can do that? <laughs> well, they're they're elected, correct? A mo- bunch of judges' positions. Well, that's right? another one of the biases that creeps in. You know, they're. Sometimes they're just playing for the grandstand. Yep. If there's an election oh, yeah. coming up. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah, so it's like my arbitration is now put to the whims of this tragedy of the commons on who's going to be the next judge here. So it's kind of a joke, the whole thing. Well, a lot of it is, unfortunately, as, as we've mentioned multiple times with the, you know, the litany of victimless crime laws that are out there that people are being dragged into the court for the, you know, for that's them. just the tip of the iceberg, you know? Yeah. But I, I think your original point when you started down this line, Dave, was the, you know, gumming, trying to gum up the system in any way and people, you know, fighting this. Uh, and it's, it's not cheap, you know, and like I said, I, I learned the hard way that here in this, you know, specifically in the County that I live in, and I, I'm sure it is this way in, in, in other places too, but you know, where the corruption runs really deep, it really is. They, they'll, 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 you know, they'll indict as many people as they can because they're really, 
after you know and they you know like any good any good little prosecutor they'll tack on as many additional charges as they can you know they do the, they do the same thing in traffic court they do, you know as they do here in the criminal courts they just tack on as much as they can to try to scare you and hope that you'll uh, you know, you'll be afraid that you'll have to spend, you know, a buttload of money. So you won't, you'll just say, fine, I'll take whatever deal you give me, you know, uh, even if you, act, even if you didn't do the thing that they're claiming that you did, right, regardless of whether the thing you did is actually wrong or not, you know, like it's, it, they, they scare a lot of people into that. So, I mean, I, I've preached it. I wish I, you, you know, I wish pe more people would. I mean, obviously I've said, I, I know a lot of people obviously aren't in my position where I was, you know, I was lucky. The first round of money I needed was, uh, was, donated to me. So that was awesome, you know, and, uh, this second round, I got a, a short term loan from my dad, uh, which I may end up having to pay him back in cryptocurrency at this point, but whatever, uh, you know, he was basically a mini Donald Trump. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, um, just draw, you know, I, I, I am trying to take it as far as I can. Cause I, I know, you know, you could just see this is what happens because I'm obviously not like in my particular case, I'm obviously not a threat to them um, or I'm not even a threat to society in their, in their, uh, in their view, because they'll, they're willing to push this case off as, you know, forever at this point, I think we're up to like uh, appearance seven or eight. Now I, I don't even, I have to go look, I, I've lost track, you know, and still not even a trial date set. So I'm not, I'm obvious. And, and I'm, you know, I'm loose on the street on a thousand dollars bail. So I'm not a threat in any way in their eyes. So they're really just hanging on to uh, hopefully hope that I'll take the deal that they offered so they can uh, they can claim victory and get and get some money out of me, um, actually a bunch of money out of me, unfortunately, uh, you know, but that's that just seems to be their M.O. So, you know, or that that's why I said earlier that I, I didn't think there was too many of you. I don't think there's too many Randy's here in this uh, in this in this department, at least. You know, even if they are, they probably don't get to do much of anything because this is the overriding idea of this, you know, of the of that DA's office is just, you know, try to get as many people as you can to plea. So uh, we don't have to really do a lot of work and uh, we get to collect our money. <laughs> One last question I have for you, Randy. Um, I know this is a little ways off for me. What's a reasonable rate to charge? Well, I, mean, I realize it ch it depends on it has that course, that that is the that's probably the most local of all considerations in uh if you're in uh you know what in the town that you're in because you're you're literally competing with just the all the attorneys that are around you and uh, I uh, for me in in criminal law unless I was uh doing uh, some federal cases uh, I would always charge a flat rate. So you might have a DWI and, and, uh, and I would say, I, I, you know, charge you $1,400 to handle the case if it didn't have to go to trial. And, um, that would, you find out real quickly that you're too high or too low enough of your clients. There's people that are polite enough that after they come and talk to you and then they talk to somebody else and they don't hire you, they'll actually call you up and tell you, well, I, I talked to somebody else and I money was tied and they said they'd do it for this. And, you know, I'd say, well, well, I appreciate you telling me that. And you find where you are. And if you're a new guy in town, you're going to probably have to lowball and get the business because you're the cheapest guy because, you know, you're pretty new and, you know, they, they, they hire you for that reason. You get your experience and then you can charge more later. It's it's kind of like just about any any other business, I suppose. Yeah, uh, that part of it's completely free, you know. In terms of the government being involved, they don't they're not in it. Fair well, enough. Uh, well, so I, 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 you charge what the market price is. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say uh, never having been a lawyer, but having having been a businessman for uh, over a dozen years, my, my suggestion to you, Andre, would be to do the same thing that I did uh, when I started my business. Just Go to the area that you're going to call up all your, uh, you know, call up as much of the competition as you can posing as a prospective client and ask questions um, about what they yeah, charge yeah. and then uh, figure out the average. And uh, like Randy said, lowball to start and then uh, take it from there. <laughs> Oddly enough, you, you can in, in, in a, at least in a small town in the legal industry, you don't even have to call them up. Um, you don't even have to call them up. If you just call up somebody, and, you know, somebody, and you just say, "I'm new," and I, I need, the lawyers, they they tend to, at least around here, tend to be very helpful to one another, even though they're competing. And if you, 
you know, at the very most, you maybe buy them a lunch to tell you anything. Oh, <laughs> it's cool. kind of kind of interesting. I that was one thing that I you know I I kind of expected to be more dog eat dog, but it really wasn't. Well, that that might be location based as well, because that's something I yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't be. see it could working be. very well. Uh, although well, actually, maybe the true. dog walking business is different. You know, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's cutthroat. It's vicious. <laughs> well, we we do fierce. have kind of a. We have kind of a built-in monopoly. We can afford to be magnanimous. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. <laughs> we only have to be magnanimous to a few people because they uh, they control the number of people entering the profession. Yeah, it's a it's a racket. That's for sure. Um, Anything with an occupational license is a racket. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, of course, dude. That's true. That is anytime the states saying hey this is what uh this guy knows what he's doing i just i don't believe it because you know you have to go with the age old adage anything the state says is has to be completely a liar right on his face right i don't believe anything yeah. well, uh, well, well, well that's, that's, a, that's a fallacy when the state yeah, licenses you you should just simply say to yourself well that means that he has the permission of the state to do business and it means nothing else that's it yep. so. yeah yeah one of the things I was thankful I never had to deal with during my during my. Unfortunately, runs. there's people that think that's important. Yeah, yeah, there is. Well, I, I, yeah, I was gonna say even in my business where there actually isn't a, a license, uh, at least currently, uh, in my in my area for for my particular business, I, I got that question a lot when I first started because people didn't know either. They just they just naturally ask, "Oh, do you are you licensed?" <laughs> And uh, when I had to explain to people that, no, there isn't actually a license. A lot of people were very confused by that. Apparently, they were used to having everything be licensed. So, Well, if you stuck around in the business long enough, eventually it probably would be. Uh, licensing happens when the members of the profession itself go to the legislature and uh, ask them to uh, create a monopoly for them, and then the Usually, legislature yes. does. Yep. And, uh, I, I, I've never heard of a of an occupational licensing scheme that was started at the behest of the public and the customer uh you know for their safety and well-being <laughs> or to ensure good quality work it's a bunch of baloney <laughs> even even in the progressive era this was true and the progressives if nothing else were moral busybodies so that should tell you something yes <laughs> yes i Ex think that's right excellent point I think that's right all right. On that note, I, I think we should uh, probably get wrapping up here. Uh, but first of all, Randy, thank you very much for joining. This was a this was a lot of fun uh, conversation. Took hey, a couple I, of different turns. Really but I think it, it, it was uh, an yes. honor for me to come on the show. I really enjoyed it, guys. Yeah, you, have, uh, Maybe, you know. Yeah. Well, thanks for putting up with us. <laughs> well. Uh, ask me back sometime. I'll come. Yeah, no, I've, I've I've meant to have like I've talked to you about this before. I meant to have you on a while ago, and like we just never got around to doing it. And then uh, w when we've been talking about law a lot recently with Andre, with his uh, trials and tribulations going through school. Yeah, yeah. Just came up again. Well, uh, I was like, we have to get him on. We have to do. We have to have this conversation. So, well, hey, every year I go to the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest in in Michigan. Maybe maybe you guys have come up there or something. Yes. I know Jeremy does, I, right? Uh, yep, I've been there the past two years, and I, I hope to see you again there this year. I plan on going. They already announced the dates. It is uh, June, 20, June, June right? 21st through the 25th, 2018. Um, yeah. Same place. All you need is a tent. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, you don't have to. I mean, I, my, uh, last, last not, not, not this past year, but the year before, my, my buddy Dylan came up there for like a night and just slept in his car. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so you don't even need a tent if you don't want one, but... For comfort's sake, I would I would think you bring one, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that again. So, yeah. yeah, if you guys can get your butts out of Alabama, you know, maybe you can actually join us this year. No, well, well I mean, if you guys held, if you if at? you guys decided to hold it in, you know, a place that's uh, nicer and uh, not so far north, this probably wouldn't be an issue. But well, it's, hey, what it's, do I know? It's beautiful, yeah. and I don't want to uh -huh. hear about it, man. I'm I drove. Sure I, it is. I drove. You know, I drove twelve plus hours to get there. I don't want to hear it. Uh huh. Yeah, well, know. why don't you guys? Uh, why don't you guys organize one? Isn't there some nice place uh, in the north of Alabama that'd be close enough for me to get to? <laughs> well, we've talked about Dave I and I. I have, Dave and I have talked about doing a Seeds of Liberty Fest since before we even started the show. I think you and I started talking about that that whole idea of doing our own mm -hmm. festival and uh you know like we we keep saying we're gonna do it and just never get around to it 
Uh, I was actually. In I just vacationed State. through. I just vacationed through Alabama two weeks ago. I didn't know you guys were down there. No, oh, yeah, I was Montgomery and uh, Dave lives by. over by Birmingham. I was in Montgomery and Birmingham both. <laughs> oh, look at that! Oh, darn. oh man, that. I missed this. Yeah, I came down from Nashville, headed down to Pensacola, and came through Birmingham, and and uh, I spent the night in Birmingham. Uh, you know, just at a motel there, and uh, and oh boy, there was a a really great brew pub up in uh, what's the place with all the rockets? Huntsville. Huntsville. Yeah, Huntsville. Yeah, yeah. There was a great brew pub there. Is that where the Ancap boys are from, Dave? Is that where the Ancap Barber boys are from? What was that? Sorry, I didn't hear that last part. (laughs) The Ancap Barber boys, aren't they up in Huntsville? Yeah, they're up in Huntsville. It's a little bit south from. Another one of our podcasting friends. They're a little bit south from Huntsville, I believe. I think. uh, They were up in that neighborhood. I can't remember what it was called. Yeah. You know me. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know your state any better than you know mine. Well, actually, that's not true. Because uh, at least I don't. At least I know what, what's a city and what's not. You know, <laughs> nonsense. Well, well, you guys have one in your state. I'll come down. Yes, sir. Well, we've yeah, started, yeah. Well, we're going to try to do that the eventually. Seed, well, soon. the seed, the seeds fest. I we, just got to start. We were going to do in Tennessee. I think was the last place we thought we were looking. Because there we go. We were trying to get. That'd the, be close enough. I, I we wanted were, to do it. I wanted to do it fifty miles outside of you know, like just draw a circle around Nashville and do it somewhere yeah. within fifty miles. Well, of that. yeah, because we want to. So well, that way yeah. it's easy we're, airport. Yeah, we're trying to get as cent- we're trying to get as centralized as possible because you know, with all the other festivals, like you know, when Pork Fest was still a happening thing, you know, that's all the way up in New Hampshire, and you know, Midwest Peace Celebrity Fest is great, but it is in Michigan, which is kind of central but north. You know, and I think I think like Kansas is the most central area, but nobody wants to go to Kansas. So we were thinking if we set something up in te- somewhere in Tennessee or something, we'd have a lot a better chance of bringing a lot more people from the south. And uh, near Nashville would be perfect. It really would. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yes. that's what we're thinking. We said that, but you know, it depends if 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 I finally get out of here and end up in Indiana and end up, end up with my, <laughs> end up with my farmland sooner or later, I may do I may be doing something up there too because. Uh, you know, that was another whole thing with me. If I, I get enough land, I definitely want to use it at least once a year for an event like that. So, all right. I'm sure you'll let us know then. Oh, it comes. yeah. yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, I definitely will. But, all right. So, hey, guys. Thank you very much. Oh, I, uh, pleasure is really all enjoyed ours. it. Uh, I, I hope your equipment was able to capture everything. <laughs> oh, we, we, we got it all, Randy. Don't, don't you worry. Except the coughs. <laughs> Oh well, you know that, that that's what that's what the editing is for. But anyway, uh, Andre, Dave, anything else before we go? Nope. I'm uh, good. Uh, well, I don't know if Randy's ever been asked this, but I guarantee he'll have a good answer. What's your favorite quote? You can end the show with it. My favorite quote. Well, I already gave that. An unjust law is oh, no law. It. Well, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> There's, there's, we'll see what is so just many, is uh, what subjective so is subjective to the individual because that would be a value. Oh, judgment. we're not going down that. We're not going down that rabbit hole right <laughs> now, Dave. Thank you. Never mind. All right. So, all right. Again, thank you, Randy. This this was a great conversation. Um, this, Good night, guys. This this has been the Seeds of Liberty uh, podcast. It was a pleasure. Uh, all of our information can be found at solpodcast.org. Uh, Patreon still up and going. Another episode. Oh, geez, I just realized. I don't think I put an episode out this week. Oh, I'll have to scramble and make sure we get one out. But uh, there will be another, another one coming out. Uh, and uh, thank you, everybody who keeps donating. So uh, please go check that out and consider donating yourself if you're not already. All right. So we will uh, we'll catch you next time. Peace. Peace in the Middle East. Yeah. Thank you.
Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com. This is Michael Dean from the Freedom Teens Radio Show. I've run websites since 1996 and have used over a dozen web hosts in that time. AgoristHosting.com is the only one that hasn't broken my heart. Agorist Hosting's uptime and service is stellar, and their DDoS mitigation is the best I've seen. That's important because if you tell the truth in this world, you'll ruffle feathers. No matter what the haters hit us with, Agorist Hosting keeps our websites online. If you have a mission-critical commercial presence or a world-changing activism site, go with AgoristHosting.com.